I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. David Bocadio, who has another idea for a novel treatment for Alzheimer's disease, and uh, we're looking toward a cocktail right now, are we? <laughs> Dr. Bocadio. All right. Thank you, Lynn, for the introduction. And I'd like to thank Hotgon and all of the organizers for uh, putting on this really important event that communicates a lot of the research uh, that's going on within the area to the broader community, which is something that's really important to do to emphasize the, the impact that we're having in the region on this very important problem. So uh, today I, I want to share with you one particular thread of research that has been going on in the Laboratory of Chemical Biology, which is the lab that I had at Simon Fraser University. And the focus of our lab really is to develop chemical and biochemical tools that we can use to probe the function of various proteins involved in a number of different human diseases with a particular focus on neurodegenerative disease. And uh, in particular, I wanted to talk about one theme of research in our lab that has started from an area of very fundamental basic research and has progressed into preclinical, translationally oriented research and has ultimately emerged into the, the clinic very recently. So uh, before I go much further, I want to uh, acknowledge a great group of people that I work with, uh, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and technicians. Uh, this is a picture of all of them, a great group of people to work with. I also want to acknowledge uh, the generous support of a, of a wide range of different funding bodies that support our research focused on Alzheimer's as well as uh, other neurodegenerative diseases including, for example, Parkinson's uh, and various other uh, research themes in our lab. So I also need to make this disclosure of conflict of interest in that uh, some of our research that I'm going to be talking about today has been licensed into a spin-off company known as Electos Therapeutics, and I'm involved with them as a founder, uh, consultant, and member of the Scientific Advisory Board. So one theme of research in our lab really focuses on this issue of uh, what's known as glycosylation, which is really th how various sugar units are added one to another, just as you can see here, these different symbols represent different sugar units. And these different sugar units come together to form these elaborate structures that are themselves attached to proteins found on the surface of every cell within the body. So our body is made of several trillion cells. Our brains have about 100 billion neurons. And every one of those cells has this coding of carbohydrates. And this is really one of the frontier areas of molecular biology in which people are trying to understand what the roles of these carbohydrates are in human health and disease. And so that's a major focus in our lab. I'm not going to be talking about our research on understanding these proteins and the glycosylation found on the surface of the cell. Instead, today I'm going to focus here on this particularly poorly understood protein modification, which involves just the attachment of a single sugar unit onto proteins, many different proteins found on the inside of cells. And you can see there's a difference. There's a whole bunch of sugar units that form these complex structures shown over here. But these proteins on the inside of the cell just have a single sugar unit attached onto them. So the chemical structure of this sugar unit is just shown over here. And it's somewhat awkwardly known as o -glucnac. And in this particular case, it's attached onto this red folded structure. And I think both Hakon and Neil provided a really nice background. These proteins are composed of a chain of amino acids. And they fold to form these really elaborate, elaborate and intricate structures that enable them to fulfill their functions within the cell. And there are thousands and thousands of these different proteins. And their function is essential to maintaining health of all of the neurons within the brain. So there are two proteins, enzymes, that regulate the modification of these proteins with this specific sugar. One of them is just short, uh, named shortly here as OGT, and this enzyme puts the sugar unit on. A second enzyme, known as OGA, acts to cut the sugar unit off and return the protein to its unmodified state. So these two proteins act in tandem to regulate the amount of the sugar modification on proteins within the cell. What's striking is also that this sugar modification can occur in a way that antagonizes 
another protein modification known as phosphorylation. Many of you in the audience will, may have heard about protein phosphorylation. It's involved in regulating many cellular signaling pathways, and abnormal phosphorylation is implicated in a wide range of diseases. So this ability for O-gluknac, as this sugar modification is termed, to antagonize protein phosphorylation is something that has piqued considerable interest in the field. That is also coupled to the observation that the levels of the sugar modification found on proteins are regulated by the amount of glucose that can be taken up by cells, including neurons within the brain. So, for example, if a cell has an abundant amount of glucose available, about 1% to 5% of the glucose that's taken up by a neuron is converted within the cell into this specialized sugar, and it's installed on these proteins within the cells. So the converse is also true, is that if you have impaired ability to take up glucose up into cells, you get decreased levels of this sugar modification over here. So you have fewer sugar modifications on these proteins within the cell. So all of these features, this nutrient responsiveness of the sugar modification known as O-gluknac, its ability to act antagonistically to protein phosphorylation, and its presence on a large number of different proteins have stimulated considerable interest. And this has led to this sugar modification, known as O-gluknac, being implicated in a number of different physiological processes, as well as diseases, including Alzheimer's. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. So I, I think Hakan and Neil gave a really great overview of these two pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. You have the amyloid plaques that are found in between neurons, but you also have these neurofibrillary tangles that are composed of this protein known as tau. And these neurofibrillary tangles are clumps of this protein tau, which then choke the neurons, leading to their death. Now, this paper shown over here, published in 2004 uh, by my colleague in the United States, Cheng Zeng Gong, was really piqued my interest because there were two striking observations in this paper. One of them was that in the brains of AD patients, there were significantly lower levels of this sugar modification known as O-gluknag. But furthermore, what he observed was that the neurofibrillary tangles in the brains of AD patients had no sugar modification on them whatsoever. So this was really uh, intriguing, particularly in the context of the efforts of the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging, uh, Alzheimer's, neuro, Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative, uh, which is a consortium of academics, clinicians, and uh, companies that have banded together a large consortium to track the changes in a number of different markers that occur over the time course from the very early stages before Alzheimer's disease to full-blown clinical dementia. And so you can see that this hypothetical projection of these biomarkers as a function of disease progression shown over here, and this is taken from a paper in Lancet uh, Neurology back in 2010. One of the first features is the accumulation of this amyloid within the brain. And that's very clearly the trigger of Alzheimer's disease. But what was striking is that if you look, you can see that the next feature that appears to be aberrant is this uh, glucose utilization with the brain, which was measured using fluorodeoxyglucose PET imaging, which Hakon referred to earlier on. And so you get this early impairment in brain glucose utilization in Alzheimer's disease, and that actually precedes the loss of neurons that's manifested when you can measure, actually, atrophy of certain regions of the brain using magnetic resonance imaging. And so the idea is then, perhaps, is that this impairment in glucose utilization within the brain is actually a factor that contributes to the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And that's supported by some of these observations shown over here, which uh, it's been found very clearly that type 2 diabetes is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Coupled with that, it's known that A-beta, which, uh, which leads to the formation of these amyloid plaques, actually induces insulin resistance within the brain. And that impairs glucose uptake into the neurons. Furthermore, type 2 diabetes induces and exacerbates 
the clumping of this tau protein. So all of these observations then taken together really uh, got us to suppose that perhaps what's happening is that normally within the brain, you have glucose that's taken up by these neurons and is converted into this specialized sugar, a certain fraction of it. And that in turn is added onto this protein tau, which was alluded to earlier on uh, in that Cheng Gong paper I mentioned. And so this tau protein has a certain amount of sugar on it as well as phosphorylation. But you can have certain circumstances where you have environmental insults or you can have uh, diabetes or A-beta itself. And all of these then contribute to impaired uptake of the sugar into the brain. And if that happens, then you can have decreased flux through that pathway, and that leads to decreased levels of the specialized sugar within the brain. If that happens, what could ha- result is decreased sugar modification of this protein tau, and in the presence of other insults, that could lead to its hyperphosphorylation. The hyperphosphorylation of tau is well known to lead to the formation of toxic tau species, including oligomers, and of course, ultimately, these neurofibrillary tangles. So our idea is then perhaps what you have is a stable, soluble pool of tau that has a bunch of sugar modifications and phosphate residues on them. And this is a a happy form of tau. It's soluble, it's stable, and it doesn't clump together. But if you have impaired brain glucose utilization within, within a patient, what could happen is that you end up losing these sugar modifications because less glucose is getting into the brain. And this, in turn, enables, in the presence of other insults, the hyperphosphorylation of tau. And it's clumping together to form these toxic species. So we further hypothesize that if what we could do is block this enzyme known as OGA that I mentioned before, and this is the enzyme that cuts the sugar unit off, if we could block that enzyme, we could preserve the sugar modification of tau and other proteins. And this would prevent its clumping together to form these toxic species within the brain. So to do this, we really needed a good inhibitor of this enzyme known as OGA. And I'm going to gloss over, I think quite appropriately, as Neil did, the details of how we came up with this type of molecule. Needless to say, it was a a great effort. And this is just here a really uh, a video interlude. Shown here is the enzyme OGA which is this ribbon of amino acids that fold together to form this really intricate structure. Now, in one face of this enzyme, which acts to cut off the sugar unit, is what's known as the active site that goes, and this active site cuts off the sugar unit. And this is the structure of the inhibitor bound in the active site. And so when it's bound, it blocks the enzyme from cutting off the sugar unit. And so this is an incredibly potent inhibitor that was rationally designed to bind very tightly into this pocket. So you can take, for example, about three milligrams of this, of this molecule, this inhibitor, and put it in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. And if you had enzyme in that swimming pool, it would inhibit that, that enzyme, even at that dilution. It's just incredibly tight binding, this molecule. So we were then able to take this molecule and generate large amounts of it for testing in animal models of, uh, of human disease. And so in this particular case, we used what's known as the JNPL3 mouse model. And in this mice, uh, in these mice, they harbor a mutant f- human form of tau, which is known to lead to neurofibrillary tangles and neurodegeneration. So these mice go on to develop neurodegenerative disease and these neurofibrillary tangles. And so we treated these mice with this inhibitor for a period of eight months just by including the compound in drinking water. So after, 40, after about 40 weeks, eight months, we unblinded the experiment and analyzed all of the data. And so you could see, looking at a section of the brain, at the hindbrain and cervical spinal cord, you could see a lot of these abnormal neurofibrillary tangles. In the mice that have been treated, the green is the sugar modification. So there's much more of the sugar modification, and there's a very dramatic decrease in the amount of these abnormal toxic tau aggregates. And this was borne out in these more detailed quantitative studies that we did. You can see here in the treated animals, there's much more green than down here, and that's reflected in this bar chart. There's a lot of the sugar modification. Correspondingly, there's a decrease in the amount of these red aggregates shown over here, and that's again reflected in this bar chart. And we saw this using a number of different markers. 
So we used other approaches to look at this, looking at the cervical spinal cord, these dark inclusions are these neurofibrillary tangles. And in the mice that have been treated, there are significantly fewer of these aggregates shown over here. We were also able to quantitate biochemically the amount of this aggregated and soluble tau by isolating it and measuring it. And so you can see in the treated animals, again, there's a significant decrease. So this work that we published back in 2012 has since been replicated by a number of different academic and industrial groups. And this is just some data shown over here of published by EMD Serono, which is a, a pharmaceutical company, Merck Serono in Europe. And you can see they using the same molecule that we created. They see a very similar effect, decreased neurofibrillary tangles, and again, reflected in this bar chart shown over here. So this was gratifying to see this replication of our results by independent groups. But what was really striking in our study was that when we looked in the ventral, ventral horn of the cervical spinal cord, we could see that treating these mice with this inhibitor that increased the sugar modification actually protected the neurons against neurodegeneration. So this was one of the first examples of a compound that could protect against tau-induced neurodegeneration. So we wanted to understand the biochemical basis by which this protection was happening. And so we carried out these in vitro experiments using purified tau, just in a test tube. We took tau that was not modified with any sugars, and then we took tau that was modified with sugars. And we looked at how quickly these aggregated and how much they aggregated. And that data is shown over here. So we take tau and we see, does it aggregate? Now this is the data shown over here. The tau that has no sugar modification, this is shown in the black data, aggregates very quickly and it reaches a high steady state of aggregates. The tau that has the sugar modification shown here in gray, aggregates much more slowly, and moreover, it reaches a much lower steady state. And the red here is a control in which there's no tau whatsoever. And this was also independently replicated also by Lawrence McIntosh here, whom, with whom we collaborate at the University of British Columbia. So then what we have concluded then on the basis of this is really that what you have are these stable soluble forms of tau, and the blocking OGA prevents loss of the sugar and the formation of these aggregates. But the sugar also prevents the, the incorporation of the sugar-modified tau into these aggregates shown over here. So in conclusion, then, uh, increased oglucnac protects against tau pathology. Uh, it's independently observed by many people. Uh, OGA inhibition is well tolerated. And uh, oglucnac may act directly by reducing aggregation propensity of tau, as I mentioned. And finally, there's this nice report that was just published in December of last year, published by Linda Shea Wilson at Caltech, that provides really nice genetic support for our observations, in which they knocked out the enzyme that puts the sugar unit on. And these mice that no longer were able to get the sugar unit put on actually demonstrated very significant neurodegeneration. So with that, uh, I, this is SFU. Back here is uh, downtown Vancouver. I want to acknowledge, again, funding organizations a great group of collaborators as well, including Gideon Davies, who did all the structural biology. And finally, I want to make this disclosure of conflict of interest and note also that uh, Electos has partnered with Merck, uh, and together they've moved OGA inhibitors now into phase one clinical trials.